it's Hyper Halloween. First up for my supernatural horror film section is 1985's House, or 1986, depending on where you look. The story of House was written by Fred Decker, the same man who wrote Night of the Creeps and Monster Squad. The film was directed by Steve Miner and produced by Sean S. Cunningham. The movie is listed as a comedy horror, and it certainly does have some comedic elements. But I do believe that there are some psychological horror elements throughout the film as well. I'll do my best to explain that as I progress. Without further ado, let's discuss the plot. This movie begins with a delivery boy going to the titular house. He enters it and finds its main resident hanging from a noose on the ceiling. The resident is Mrs. Hooper, the aunt of our main protagonist, Roger Cobb, played by William Catt. Cobb's aunt was said to not have a history of mental illness, but that is certainly brought into question throughout the film. Roger Cobb himself is an author that currently has one hit book on the market. He's constantly pressured by his fans and publisher to get started on his second book. He wants to write about his experiences in Nam, and no one really wants to read that. I'm not being mean either. Whenever he brings it up, the characters he's talking to have a look of disgust on their face. Cobb is a troubled individual though. He's still haunted by his time spent in Nam, as is seen through several dream sequences throughout the movie. He feels compelled to write about his experiences, and that's probably a good thing. I imagine that's therapeutic for him in some ways. He decides to ultimately move into his aunt's house, which is unfortunately another form of trauma for him. Cobb used to live there with his wife and son, but his son disappeared one day while they were outside. Cobb's aunt believed the house to be haunted, and that contributed to his missing son. So he's got that going for him as well. Regardless, Cobb moves into his aunt's house to get his book done. Sure enough, Cobb starts hearing voices upstairs in his aunt's old room. There's a monster in his aunt's closet that springs out at him when the clock strikes midnight. There's also a group of possessed gardening tools that chase after him from time to time. So, for the remainder of the film, Cobb is trying to finish his book, as well as figure out what is going on with his house. He pretty much just sticks to himself throughout the film, probably because he pushes everyone away from him. Despite being a bit of a loner, Cobb does have a good support network. Even though he and his wife split up after the disappearance of their son, she still cares for Cobb. His neighbor Harold, played by George Wendt, is also concerned about Cobb's behavior. Harold frequently pops in to see how Cobb is doing. It does come off as annoying, but there is concern there, so it's nice that Harold does that throughout the film. I mentioned a few monsters, but there are other monsters and ghosts that plague Cobb as well. His ex-wife Sandy, played by Kay Lenz, appears midway through the film because Harold called her because he was concerned about Cobb's behavior. She transforms into a horrible monster and he kills her. Her body reverts back to normal and he ultimately has to hide the body. He does this by chopping her up and burying her out in the backyard in several different spots. It's bizarre, but it does work in this movie. It's strange though because his ex-wife's body parts do revert back to their monster form, so we're not really sure what's going on. There's also a scene where he ends up babysitting his neighbor's kid and some ghost kids try to kidnap the boy. Cobb manages to get him back and everything is fine. Oh, I also forgot to mention the most important monster, Big Marlin that's hanging on the wall. That's right, there's a big fish that's mounted on the wall that comes to life to plague Cobb. Cobb shoots it with a shotgun and well, that's pretty much the end of it. <laughs> okay, I'm just kidding about the fish being the most important monster. Throughout the film, we see Cobb's memory of his time in Nam. He had a fellow soldier that was named Big Ben. Big Ben was a loudmouth know-it-all that ended up getting hurt. He asked Cobb to end his life so he wouldn't suffer, but Cobb couldn't and ran away. We see that Ben got captured, and that's the end of Ben as we know it. And it's also the beginning of Cobb's PTSD. So, I want to talk about the ending now, so spoilers if you don't want to hear it. So, the ending? I don't like it. The movie ends with a demon version of Big Ben tormenting Cobb. Cobb also finds his kid by entering the other world through a mirror in his bathroom. Cobb eventually overcomes his issues by literally standing up to his demons, saving his son, and possibly rekindling his relationship with his wife, which I'll discuss more in a bit. The ending is just too happy and doesn't really make any sense. The movie leads the viewer to believe everything is mostly in Cobb's head, 
but the ending doesn't reflect that. Throughout the film, we see Cobb deal with his mental well-being as he writes about his traumatic experience in Nam. All of the demons he faces are manifestations of guilt or convenience. Now when I say convenience, I mean he creates a lot of the scenarios he's in based on the paintings in his aunt's house. He believes that the closet in his aunt's room is a portal to another world based on a painting in the garage. The demon only pops out at 12 a.m. and that is also referenced in the painting. The possessed tools are also based on a painting within the house. Cobb honestly reminds me a lot of Mike Dawson from Dark Seed 1 and 2. And what I mean by that is I believe that Cobb creates a lot of what he deals with based on the things he reads and interactions with people in the movie. In Cobb's case, it's similar, but there's also the added detail of his PTSD and him taking Valium on and off. One of the side effects of not taking his medication consistently is cognitive problems. In my opinion, Cobb invents the scenario at the ending of the film with Big Ben. Big Ben is his former comrade during the war. Cobb blames himself for Ben's capture, even though Ben was a pretty shit soldier, and Cobb dreams up that Ben kidnapped his kid so that he could rescue him. Back to Cobb's wife, her transforming into a monster is also probably guilt related. He's seen lying to her on multiple occasions throughout the film, and I'm sure he feels really bad about their son going missing since, well, he went missing under his supervision. We as the audience can't be sure if he killed his wife or not. Given Cobb's mental state, it's possible that he may have killed her when she turned into a monster and only imagined her coming back later. It can also be argued the other way as well. The demon kids we see trying to kidnap the neighbor's child are a little easier to explain. He fantasizes about this because he feels guilty about losing his own son. He and his aunt both blame the supernatural phenomena that happens in the house. He makes up the entire scenario to feel better about what happened many years ago. The fish is another thing that's telegraphed early on in the film between Cobb and the real estate agent. They basically flat out say what it's going to do later on. The last demon I can think of is the monster in his aunt's closet. According to IMDb, the monster is designed to resemble a mass of napalm bodies from Nam, including bullets for fingers. This is clearly PTSD related as the war traumatized him. With all that being said, I'm wondering if the end of the movie might actually be the ending to his story. And what I mean by that is, Cobb's combining his experience with Nam along with his past experiences of losing his son. We have seen him physically act out scenes in his head, so it would just make sense that he's playing through another scenario. If anything, it makes more sense to me than what we got. To me, it makes more sense that all the ghost things are in Cobb's head. I'd even say that everything is in his aunt's head as well. We hear some characters mention that she was a bit crazy, so it's possible that she internalized a lot of her issues given that older generations wouldn't discuss mental issues as openly as people today. So earlier in the review, I mentioned that House is a horror comedy, but the original story didn't have any comedy at all. Ethan Wiley adapted or rewrote the script and added the comedic elements. House received three sequels overall, and I've only seen this one in the second movie. And actually, I often get the two mixed up. But if I remember correctly, I don't think the second one is related to the first one at all. I'm not sure about three and four though. Overall, House's visuals are really impressive, and it has a pretty unique story as well. It definitely makes you think long after the movie is over. House is also a movie that tries to shine a light on how bad PTSD was for our nom vets, but it isn't so in your face about it. The movie does rely a bit on jump scares, but the creature designs are top notch. Despite not really liking the ending, I still recommend checking House out.